Oh, yeah, that's done. Here we go. Hi, and welcome to everyone as you're gradually joining us um, on this evening. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, we're going to give it another couple of minutes just to uh, let uh, uh, a few more of you join in. I know that we've had uh, a, a vast number of uh, attendees uh, registering. Uh, so we'll give it another maybe couple of minutes or so um, and then hopefully get uh, started. Brilliant. I think we've had more and more and more people uh, joining in. Uh, so as I was explaining to, to those that joined in uh, right at the beginning at bang on seven o'clock, we're just going to wait for perhaps uh, another uh, 60 seconds or so um, and uh, wait for a number of attendees that have registered to, to join us. Um, so far, I know that there are about 373 of us uh, on here. Um, so we'll give it another 60 seconds or so uh, and hopefully kick off. Now would probably be a good time to grab a glass of water and to perhaps think about the sort of questions you want to put to our panel um, over the course of, uh, of this event. Brilliant. Okay, so let's get uh, started. Um, so first and foremost, welcome to everyone to tonight's webinar, which I'm sure will be absolutely fantastic and really informative for everyone tuning in, um, because we'll be talking about the NHS pension and how the pension age discrimination judgment will affect you. A bit about me, my name is Dr. Abbas Tajani. I'm a GP partner and occupational physician based in Leicester. I wear a number of educational hats, including being chair of the City Academy at the Leicester Medical School, where I also serve as an honorary senior lecturer, as well as being the first five chair for the Royal College of GPs in Leicestershire. Now, I've been at the forefront of postgraduate medical education in Leicestershire for the last five years, and I'm the co-founder and director of Cornerstone Medical Education along with my wife, Dr. Isra Altai, and we host a vast number of courses all around the country from subject masterclasses to practical courses like minor surgery and pest reinsertion workshops. Um, if you're interested, please do uh, give us a look up. Um, a bit of housekeeping before we get started. It's really important to say that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on the Royal College of GPs YouTube channel after the event. And if you weren't able to attend live and you're watching us on demand, hello from us all. We hope you find this discussion useful as well. Just as a brief overview, overview of tonight's event, um, the RCGP are collaborating with Wesleyan to bring you this webinar covering what the pension age discrimination judgment is and how it might affect you and your pension. We have three brilliant speakers tonight who will go into detail and answer your questions. We'll give each speaker 15 minutes uh, to speak or thereabouts, followed by a 45 minute open forum to get your questions answered. Now we've collected questions from the audience prior to the event, which the speakers have already seen and will try to answer in their presentations or just after. But if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to make use of the Q&A function, uh, the chat function, or raise your hand uh, and we will try to answer them uh, during the Q&A uh, part of this session. If you have questions specific to your personal circumstances, though, we may not be able to answer your questions at this webinar, but we'd strongly encourage you to get directly in touch with Wesleyan on wesleyan.co.uk forward slash RCGP webinar, and that link will be shown um, just before we go into the Q&A, or to con contact Yorkshire Medical Accountants, which is very simple, Yorkshire Medical Accountants, all one word, .co.uk. 
Um, we've got two Royal College of GP staff, Alice and Louise, on the conference. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to message them directly. And I should probably use this juncture to thank them tremendously for their hard work behind the scenes to make tonight all possible for everyone. Um, there'll be a number of uh, polls uh, during the presentation, and this will be really, really useful, actually, just to see um, where everyone is in terms of their understanding of the NHS pension, and just to see how many of us are in the same boat, because I know for myself, when it comes to the NHS pension scheme, I'm completely lost at sea. Um, so we'll hope, we hope you'll be able to stay for the duration of the seminar. We know there's going to be a lot to take in, but the items we'll talk about here tonight are really important to us GPs. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce Paul Forder from Wesleyan, uh, to take it away. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Abbas, and thank you for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> yeah, what we're going to be doing is doing a, a very a good presentation with regards to the NHS pension, giving you a bit more detail about that. Uh, my colleague James Gunnery will be taking you through that uh, very shortly. Uh, before we do that, I'd like to just introduce myself. My name is Paul Forder. Uh, I've been with the Wesleyan now for 16 years, uh, dealing with GPs throughout that entire time, at all stages of their career, and helping them alongside with their financial planning in all areas of anything financial that we can help with really. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, tell you a little bit about the Wesleyan before we get going, thank you for that. Uh, you can see from the, the slide that we've got in front of yourself, the Wesleyan have been around for 170, over 175 years. We're actually gonna be celebrating our 180th birthday next year. Uh, we've been set up uh, really to primarily advise our financial services for our chosen uh, areas that we look at. And primarily in this area, it's gonna be within general practice. Uh, one of the things that sets us aside from other key, people, uh, key uh, companies is very much our advisory board. And this is set up with an eminent professionals that help us steer where we're going with advice and make sure we're on track to provide the uh, products and services uh, and advice for our client bank that we've got. We have a team of financial consultants out there that specialize in the medical profession and specifically within general practice as well. This enables them to keep up to date with all stages of their financial planning, throughout all of their career as well and really coming up to retirement and one of the key things obviously with the NHS pension it's incredibly complex so it enables them to really get a focus on this because it is the foundation of your financial planning with everything that's going on at the moment with the changes which James and Alison will be going through with you shortly there's a lot to be sort of taken into account and your own personal situation will come into this. We're a mutual society and we're very proud to remain within our mutual society as well it means that we work towards the benefit of our clients and sort of look after those, which means that we also work within our sort of foundation, which helps with charitable uh, companies that we work with as well. What I'd like to do though is hand you over now to my colleague James, who will take you through a bit more about the NHS pension. Thank you very much, Paul. So first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. So I'm James Gunnery. I'm a financial consultant here at Wesleyan. Today, I'll be going to be going through a list of uh, details regarding the pension, and we'll start now. So the key areas we'll be covering off today are types of membership and the various sections within them, how to increase your benefits, alternative ways of saving for retirement, annual and lifetime allowance considerations plus scheme pays, key scheme benefits to be aware of, COVID-19 related changes. Oops, excuse me one second. Um, pension age discrimination, and then finally tips for planning ahead and your next steps following this webinar. Okay, on this slide now, we will start our first poll. This should be coming up any second now. And this first poll will be, do you know which section of the NHS pension scheme you are in? So let's start by looking at some of the specifics of the NHS pension scheme for GPs. In the 1995 section, your pension is based on 1.4% of your operated earnings. Each year, your earnings are added to a pot, which is then revalued annually according, according to inflation. The resulting figure is known as your operated earnings. You will, you will also receive a lump sum that is three times your annual pension. In the 2008 section, your pension is based on 1.87% of your operated earnings, and if you moved to the 2008 section following the previous pension choice exercises, then part of your pension will automatically be given up to purchase a minimum lump sum equivalent to the lump sum built up within the 1995 section. In the 2015 section, if you are a tapered or a transition member or join the NHS after the 1st of April 2015, you will receive an annual pension calculated at 154th of each pensionable pay. 
the 154th of your pensional pay is added to each, each part each year and revalued in line with inflation. The resulting figure is your pension. Any benefits you have built up in the previous sections prior to the transition to the 2015 scheme are preserved. Now you can increase your lump sum you receive of any part of the scheme by converting part of your pension provided you have, ser uh, you have service on or after the 1st of April 2008. That's a key note to remember that for every £1 per year uh, pension you give up, you will receive a, uh, a £12 uh, lump sum. So are we able to refer to the first poll results? Okay, nothing coming up on my side. So we have 69% uh, have said yes and 31% have said no. Okay, that's brilliant. That's a really good result. Okay, moving on to the next slide. So let's find out a little bit more about the 2015 Career Average Revalued Earning or the Kerr Scheme. Now this is um, itself essentially your pension. Um, it will be calculated differently compared to the 95 and the 2008 section. You will earn a set percentage of your pay uh, as a pension and each year um, this will be revalued. Oops, excuse me, just get a couple of comments there for the chat, okay. Now your pension pot will continue to be revalued every year in line with, in line with indexation. And this percentage is then added to your pension each year to adjust for inflation. Now, if you're a tapered or a transition member, you'll keep the benefits built in the 95 and the 2008 section. These are preserved upon moving to the Kerr scheme and will usually still keep in line uh, with your final salary. Now, if you'd like to understand more around what type of uh, member you are and the overall impact to your benefits between these three schemes, it is worth speaking to a financial consultant around this. Okay, so let's look at how you could actually increase your benefits. So firstly, in the 1995 and the 2008 sections, you can buy additional pension up to a maximum of £5,000 in multiples of £250 and make additional voluntary contributions or ADCs. Now, if you already have an added year's contract, they can continue. Although as of April 2008, no new contracts may be taken out. Now onto the 2015 section. You can still buy additional pensions, but up to the maximum of six and a half thousand pounds in multiples of 250 pounds. ABCs can also be made. However, in this section, you can also use the early retirement reduction buyout, otherwise known as ERBO. For Scotland, the additional pension limit in 2015 scheme is 6,750. Now we're going to have a look at each of these in more detail. So you can choose to buy additional pension as either a lump sum or a regular payment over a maximum of 20 years. Additional pension is paid at the, at the same time as your main NHS pension. If it is paid before your normal pension age, it will be reduced to take into account of its early payment. Additional pension can be bought at any time during the year as either, either a personal cover, which increases your own pension uh, benefits, or dependence cover, which increases your own uh, pension benefits as well as your spouse or dependent children. In the 2015 section, you can buy any amount in units of 250 pound up to the maximum of six and a half thousand. And in the 95, 2008 uh, section, this limit was 5,000 pounds and these limits work independently. So as a member uh, who has moved from the 2008 to the 2015 section, who bought 5,000 pounds of additional pension before moving over, you could now buy an additional six and a half thousand pounds in the new section. Next slide, please. Okay. So another way for you to increase your pension is through AVCs, additional voluntary contributions. This allows you to contribute lump sums or regular payments into a separate account. These contributions are then invested and when you retire, you can use this to provide extra income for you and your dependents uh, to retire early. 
This can be known as bridging the gap. You can get tax relief on your ABCs, so that adding £100 per month will only cost you £60 as a 40% taxpayer, or £80 as a 20% taxpayer. So it is an efficient way to boost your retirement savings. You can stop, restart, or adjust your payments at any time, or make one-off lump sum contributions. As your ABC pot is invested, its value may fluctuate and is not guaranteed. What you will receive will depend on the funds chosen and how it performs. When you start taking benefits, you can take up to 25% of the fund value as a tax-free lump sum. This is an addition to any lump sum you take from the scheme. That's the NHS scheme. When you take benefits, you may have the following three options subject to your lifetime allowance. Firstly, you can take a single or series of lump sums. Secondly, take a flexible access drawdown. This is a new form of drawdown, which will allow you to take um, almost unlimited amounts of income or lump sums from your pension fund, and this is limited to the value of the fund. Thirdly, you can take a pension annuity, which is guaranteed to secure an income for the rest of your life, regardless of how long you live. Any amount taken over the tax-free cash limit will be taxable. Another provision only available in the 2015 section allows you to pay extra contributions so that you can retire before your normal pension age without a penalty or a reduced penalty. This means your pension may not be reduced at all or may only be reduced by a smaller amount. There are a few caveats to this. The maximum early retirement reduction buyout is lower of three years or the number of years you are over the age of 65. Only years over 65 can be bought out. For example, if your normal pension age is 66, you'll only be able to opt uh, for one year's actuarial adjustment. If your pension age is 67, you can buy two years and so on. The buyout option will be available for three months after you join the 2015 section and will be backdated to the joining date. There will be uh, further opportunities to purchase buyouts for three months after each anniversary. So you can do this if you are retirement age of 65 or over. We are keeping an eye on the questions that are coming through. So we will uh, go, through, go, through, go through these in great detail towards the end. So uh, we have a second poll. Do you believe the NHS uh, pension will provide enough for your retirement? It's an interesting poll, this one. So as this slide highlights, if you're looking at planning and funding your retirement, it doesn't have to solely uh, be carried out through a pension vehicle. In fact, retirement planning can be done through a range of different types of assets and plans. And again, speaking to your local financial consultants, they'll be able to advise you on all aspects of your wider retirement planning that could supplement your NHS pension scheme membership. How were the poll results for this? Let's uh, have a look. So, um, can you see them uh, in front of you or do you want me to go through it? I can't see them. Okay, so um, do you believe the NHS uh, pension scheme will provide enough for your retirement? Yes, 26%, no, 31%, but an overwhelming, I don't know, at 43%. Okay. Okay. Right, so moving on to one of the um, bigger subjects of the pension, which uh, again, we will spend a bit of time on this one. So again, there has been another a poll on this. Do you know the current annual or lifetime allowance limits? Okay, we'll, we'll touch on this in a little bit, but let's look a little bit more in detail at the annual allowance. So for the defined contributions, it's the money that can be paid into your pension up to a certain limit each year without having to pay any uh, tax. However, the NHS pension is a defined benefit, so it's the amount that can be accrued over a year. And for 2020-21 tax year, this is currently £40,000. Any amount over the annual allowance will be liable for a tax charge. This could be up to 40% and is dependent on other taxable income. It's not just your NHS income, plus the highest income tax band. You can also carry forward any unused allowances from the three previous tax years. From the 6th of April 2014, this is a maximum of £40,000 per year. 
Now, many may be subject to a lower annual allowance due to the new rule introduced on the 6th of April 2016, which affects high earners, known as tapering. If you have an annual allowance charge uh, due to this uh, new lower limit, then the scheme does not have to pay, nor do they have an obligation to inform you of this breach. So let's look at an issue of tapering in more detail. So as of the 6th of April 2016, the annual allowance reduced by £1 for each £2 of income over the adjusted income limit. So from the 1st of April 2020, the adjusted income was 240000 which is your taxable income, including the value of your pension savings in that year. Again, that's the growth of the fund. The maximum reduction is 36000 So anyone with an adjusted income of £312,000 or more the tapered annual allowance will be reduced to £4,000. Between the April 2016 and April 2020, the adjusted income uh, limit was 150000 and the minimum annual allowance was 10000 So the HMRC have made some adjustments. So going back to that poll, um, did everyone know the, the current limits? So uh, the current annual and lifetime allowance limits, yes, 26%, but no, 74%. Okay. What I find from experience, um, the annual allowance has kind of mainly come out the last couple of years. And it's really, uh, it, it's imperative that we, we understand this a lot more um, uh, and to speak to a, a consultant and also an accountant. So moving over to our pension pot. So again, an, another poll. Um, oh, sorry, one second. Here we go, bring myself back up to speed. Um, so the lifetime allowance. Now, if the value of your accrued pension benefits exceed the lifetime allowance, you may become subject to a change. When valuing your defined benefit, um, benefit against the lifetime allowance, every one pound of annual pension you receive um, is usually, usually multiplied by a factor of 20. Now, the value of your retirement lump sum is added to the capitalized value so if you have an annual pension of 50,000, this would mean uh, 50,000 times 20, 1 million, and then you would need to add on your lump sum to, uh, on top of this, and already you'll be over the, uh, the current lifetime allowance. So the current lifetime allowance is 1,073,100 for tax year 2020-21, and it will increase each year in line with CPI until further notice. Now, we, we are finding that the implications of annual and lifetime allowances are a key issue for many of our clients. Again, speaking to a consultant uh, who's trained in, uh, in this finer detail will, uh, will be actually be able to help you, uh, show you how it actually affects you, particularly regarding the tax implications. Um, so, it, again, it is worth speaking to us. Okay. The next part we're going to look at is scheme pays and the update. So linked to this area is the Scheme Pays Facility, which is the NHS pension scheme. Um, so they have extended this um, the availability over the last couple of years. Now, if an individual exceeds the annual allowance and a tax charge is due, they can ask their pension scheme to pay for the charge on their behalf with a corresponding reduction in benefits. Again, this is something that we can calculate for you. Now, based on the current situation around COVID-19, some changes have been, in, have been introduced regarding key aspects. Previously, if the tax charge was more than £2,000, you could ask the NHS pension scheme to pay some or all of the annual allowance tax charge if you were told them before the 31st of July of, that tax, of the following tax year. Now, the £2,000 threshold has been removed and the deadline um, has been extended to the 31st of March 2021. Uh, there's also criteria based on your total pension input within each section. Um, it is hoped these changes will support frontline workers who may struggle to pay any unexpected uh, tax during this time. Okay, so let's touch on some of the scheme benefits relating to illness. So as a pension scheme member, you will be entitled to a number of benefits based on certain factors. First, let's look at those who would come into effect if you were ill. Now, as part of your employment contract, you'll, you'll, you'll usually receive uh, the BMA contract of six months full, six months half, or as a partner, um, whatever your um, uh, partnership agreements will state. However, again, this 
it does depend on the length of service. Now, should any illness look like being permanent, then you may become entitled to an ill health retirement pension. If you are assessed as being unable to carry out the duties of your own job, you will be entitled to an early payment of the retirement benefits you have earned to date without any actuarial adjustment, and this is known as tier one. If you're assessed as being permanently incapable of carrying out the duties of both your own job and also any other regular employment during what would have been the duration to your normal job, um, you will be entitled to the retirement benefits you have earned to date, plus an enhancement. Now, this is known as tier two pension. Your tier two pension will be made up of your tier one pension plus a tier two addition. This enhancement to your retirement benefit is calculated based on the membership across the various sections. So for the 1995 and the 2008 section, it is equal to the two thirds of the difference between your age at retirement and the normal pension age. So that's the date you weren't able to work and the scheme pension age. In the 2015 section, the tier two addition is pro rata enhancement based on one half of your prospective pension in relation to your normal pension age. So let's look at the death benefits in relation to uh, your pension. Now, death and service benefit are, um, are normally, uh, is normally the equivalent of two years of your reckonable pay. However, this is currently enhanced by 60,000 for frontline workers who contract COVID-19. Your dependents do also receive some form of pension, usually half, although it's based on the member's service at the date of death. There is also pension provision for children based on the adult dependents being paid uh, and which section the member was in. Now, spouses receive half the pension the member would have received if they had retired at tier two ill health on the date of death. And if an adult's dependent pension is paid, the children's pension for one child will be dependent on what section the member was in. What I tend to say is when looking at your scheme benefits, um, it is always worth getting a copy of your total reward statement. Your total reward statement will highlight these benefits uh, and uh, basically it's a way of planning uh, towards your, your future. Next slide. It's probably worth just summarizing key changes that have come into force affecting your, uh, your pension membership during COVID-19. We've already covered changes to scheme pays. For death and service benefits, the additional 60,000 uh, benefit is payable for frontline workers who die from COVID-19 whilst contract, uh, co contracting it on duty. A related change that is definitely worth uh, being aware of is the change regarding inheritance tax, um, also in relation to frontline workers. Now, back in 2015, the government confirmed that inheritance tax would not be charged on the estate of an emergency service worker whose death had been caused by responding to an emergency circumstance. Now, during COVID-19, it is important for medical professions to be aware that the same exemption may also be applied to a death caused by the virus. And for, again, for this uh, to apply, the person in question must have contracted uh, the virus in the line of duty during the pandemic and the death caused as a direct result of this. Now, the legislation can also apply where death was uh, hastened by and aggravated by the disease when contracted at an earlier time. And for the exemption to be relevant, the estate of the person in question must be in excess of the current nil uh, rate band, which is 325,000 for the current tax year. One other change, um, from March 2020, the government temporarily suspended some of the regulations that govern the administration of the NHS pension, allowing skilled and experienced members who recently retired from the NHS to return to work to support the COVID-19 outbreak. And these measures did include the 16-hour rule, the abatement for special class status holders in the 95 section, and the abatement rule for the 2008 section and the 15 scheme. Okay, um, that was a lot of information uh, regarding your existing uh, pensions. So now uh, I'm going to turn um, across to the pension discrimination, which no doubt many of you will have heard about. So on that note, uh, poll number four has come up. 
Uh, do you understand the impact of pension age discrimination on your personal situation? So we'll start by looking at some specific dates that led the way to where we are now. In April 2015, most public sector pension schemes were reformed and members were moved into the new career average arrangement, the Kerr scheme. To protect members close to retirement, transition protection was put in place, and this included full protection for those within 10 years of retirement as of April 2012. These members would not move to the schemes. Tapered protection for those between 10 years and 13.5 years from retirement at April 2012. These members would move at a set date in the future between April 15 and April 22. In December 2018, the Court of Appeal found that these transition protections unlawfully discriminated against younger members of the firefighters scheme. And in July 2019, the government accepted that the judgment applied to all the main public service pensions, including the NHS. This consultation is the government's proposed remedy to remove this discrimination from the public sector pension schemes. So again, it's only a proposal at this stage. How did our poll results do? So don't have them up uh, in front of me as yet. Actually, I've just got them up. So do you understand the impact of pension age discrimination on your personal situation? Yes, 7%. No, 77% and unsure. 16%, I presume they would go into the no okay. category. So seven versus 93% there. Okay. So hopefully this, this flow chart will, will shed a bit of light for us. Um, so the flow chart is designed to help you understand how you could be impacted by the consultation, starting from the first specific question you should ask yourself. Now, as some members will benefit from moving to the reform scheme, rather than moving all members back to the legacy scheme, the government is proposing to give members a choice. This choice, is which scheme they wish to build benefits in during the period of the 1st of April 2015 and March 2022, which is known as the remedy period. Either the legacy scheme, which for the NHS is the 95 or the 08 sections, or the reformed NHS 2015 scheme. All active members will be moved into the reform scheme as of the 1st of April 2022. So there are two possible approaches to this. Firstly, an immediate choice where members will be asked to make a choice over which scheme they wish to receive benefits from the relevant period within 12 to 24 months after the 31st of March 2022. Secondly, the deferred choice underpin or the DCU, where members will be asked to make their choice when they access their benefits, so when they retire. In both cases, those members who have already accessed benefits will be asked to make their choices as soon as possible after the 31st of March 2022, and this choice will be applied retrospectively and the benefits corrected accordingly. So again, these are for members who have already retired. It is probably uh, useful to share our current understanding of the timeline around the pension discrimination uh, timeline and beyond. You can see that it begun uh, in 2012, moving on to the reform scheme being introduced in 2015. The remedy period comes into effect from the 5th of April 2015 to March 22. Then the various consultations are published. We then move into 2022 when choices will need to be made and then moves uh, into the reform schemes will take place. So clearly uh, a lot to consider here. And in light of what you've just seen and read and heard, uh, there's a likely to be some specific questions you'll probably be looking for help to answer. And then these may include, uh, which scheme is best for me? Will my past annual allowance figures change? What happens if I have already paid annual allowance charges? What happens if I have nominated scheme pays? Or how long do I have to change previous tax returns or scheme pays nominations? That's exactly where your local Western financial consultants can help. Regardless of your question, it is a complex area and we're on hand to, to guide you through this. So as you start looking towards the future and, and, uh, and thinking about your retirement and, how, and what it will mean to you, 
we've been working with our, our clients for some time and understand the challenges you face. And as we've seen in previous slides, now is the time for change. And with opportunities come uncertainty. A great deal of uncertainty is caused by lack of knowledge about what to do, when to do it, and often most important, how to do it. We know that you are very busy people and have limited time to carry out your own research. And even for those who have found time to do the research, the sheer number of options can be overwhelming and it can be difficult um, to navigate without any guidance. That's where we believe we are uniquely placed to help you at the start of the presentation. So uh, uniquely placed to help. And at the start of the presentation, we highlighted the many financial areas we can provide guidance on. You may be starting to consider retirement or have a plan, but need some help to get it right. It's likely you've got plenty of questions, not only around your pension, but also inheritance tax, savings, investments, and much more besides. Most importantly, we can support you with all these things. Our business is all about you, making sure we can help you achieve your aspirations, make the most of your money, secure your financial future and well-being. So what, you should, so what should you do next? Simply make an appointment with your local financial consultants. You can discuss anything you need. You'll receive advice and guidance tailored to your personal circumstances and ensure you're maximizing your NHS pension. This is likely to include inheritance tax implications, reviewing your savings plans, identifying gaps in your investment portfolio. We're here to help you. It's not just a basic level. You will see our uh, web page there highlighted if you wish to um, speak to one of our consultants. Last slide. Right, so thank you very much uh, for your time there. A lot of information we've gone through. I'm pleased to pass over now to uh, Alison Fox. Good evening, doctors. My name is Alison Fox and I'm the tax manager at Yorkshire Medical Accountants in Leeds. I have, only, I have over 30 years experience in the tax sector, including some time at BMA. I've been with Yorkshire Medical Accountants for over five years. Yorkshire Medical Accountants act for many GP practices, GP locums and hospital consultants throughout the country. You'll be aware, obviously, from what James was saying, that there's recently been a court judgment requiring the government to remedy the age discrimination that occurred in the mandatory transfer of public sector pension members, including the NHS pension members from the 1995-2008 schemes to the 2015 scheme. Members can choose to revert to the legacy scheme for the period to 1st of April 2022, which may have an effect on the annual allowance pension savings tax charges for all the years up to 2021-22. I'll begin by running quickly through the mechanism of calculation of pension savings tax charges. If I can have slide one, please. The tax charge is on the growth in the value of your pension pot, which is on the schedule is uh, column E. So that's the pension input amount for both schemes, for the 1995, 2008, and also for the 2015. If we look, for example, at 2016-17, we can, we can see that the total pension input amount is 42,876, but the annual allowance for that year is 32,150, leaving an amount of 10,726 in charge. But fortunately, there's sufficient annual allowance in charge brought forward to be able to cover this. So there's not actually any tax charge. Um, if we can see, if you look at the 2013-14 year, the actual pension input amount, the growth in the pension is 52,044. The annual allowance for that year is 50,000, leaving 2,044 in charge. 
but there is sufficient unused allowance to cover that from 2010-11, but unfortunately the amount from 2010-11 that isn't used is lost forever. For this particular example, the doctor has sufficient unused allowance to cover years up to 2017-18. It's only in year 2018-19 that there is a tax charge. And this is probably due to the annual allowance being tapered. So we can move to the next slide, please. So, sorry, the next slide after this. Yeah, this is the calculation of the tapered allowance. Basically, the threshold income is your taxable income that is shown on your tax return. So in this particular example, um, for 1920, the Taxable partnership share is 155,000, less the superannuation paid in the year. That's both the employees and the employer's share. A little bit of self-employment, a little bit of dividend and interest, giving a taxable income of 137,730. If we can move to the second slide, please. This, um, you, you take the total threshold income and you add the increase in the value of your pension pot and that comes to the adjusted income. So we, if we can see for 2019-20, the threshold income was 137,730, add a pension input amount of 44,200, the total adjusted income is 181,930. If we can move to the next slide, please. We've got total adjusted income of 181,930, the HMRC limit is 150,000, leaving an excess of 31,930. The usual annual allowance is um, 40,000, the excess is 15. So the tapered annual allowance is 24,035. If we can, there is a facility within the NHS scheme for members to elect that the tax liabilities are effectively borne by NHS pensions. And to do this, you have to um, file an election within the various deadlines. Schedule six, which is the next slide, should show the um, scheme pays election dates. Oh no, if we can, if we can go back please. And back further, and back further, back further. Yeah, these are the scheme scheme pays election deadlines. As James was saying, the um, date for 2018-19, which would normally be the 31st of July 2020, has been moved to 31st of March 2021. You have to remember that you can put scheme pays elections in based on estimated figures, and then you've got three years to adjust those figures. So for example, if you don't know whether you've got a liability for 2019-20, it's wise to put in an election, say for 25 pounds, and then that can be adjusted later, just to make sure you uh, meet the deadline. It's particularly useful for 2019-20 because the government have said that they will bear the cost of these elections, because normally what would happen is you make a scheme election and your eventual pension and lump sum is reduced on various actuarial basis by the amount you've got left to retirement and the amount of the tax that's being paid on your behalf. Um, if we go to slide seven, Again, further, yes, this, this is presuming that this particular client has chosen to move from the 2015 scheme into the 1995 scheme. And it shows that for 2017-18, where there wasn't a pension savings tax liability, there is one now. And also for 18-19, the amount has increased. So if we go to Schedule 8, it shows the difference between 
a person moving from the 2015 scheme to the 2019 to the 1995 scheme and the difference in the pension savings tax charge so they'll have a pension tax charge of 25978 if after moving to the scheme whereas they didn't have any charge before and for 1819 they'll have a tax charge of 40353 whereas before it was 11841 um, it's, there will also be a difference to the lifetime tax position, as if you elect for scheme pays elections, they will reduce the amount in your pension pot, which will save with the 55% charge within the pension scheme. It's important that all doctors ensure that their pension records are up to date, and this can be done by requesting an employment history statement from NHS pensions and also by accessing the total reward statements, which would show the dynamised income. Um, I've noticed on some of the comments that various doctors are saying that their records are not up to date. This seems to be a problem across the whole country and seems to uh, come from 2014-15 when the PCA, PC, PCSE moved up to Darlington. What we have been advising our clients here at Yorkshire Medical Accountants is to upload all your superannuation certificates, the type one, to direct electronically to PCSE, which seems to um, solve the problem. Um, finally, um, HMRC have said that um, if you want to give your staff a Christmas party, tax relief is available on any that are done, um, um, the, the, that are any are, are done remotely. Um, I, thank you for your time for listening to me. Thank you very much to to, to all of you, to, to Paul, James and, and Alison. Now it's time to open up for, for Q&A. So if you want to ask the speakers any questions, please use the <coughs> Q&A function uh, and our team will try to pick out themes for discussion from, from the chat. Now, one of the big, theme, big themes that I picked up from the chat was that a lot of people were lost at sea um, with a variety of, of acronyms and things that were used. So I'm going to give Paul and James um, 10 to 20 seconds and fire off a few acronyms at them. So um, in 10 or 20 seconds, can you explain what the annual allowance is? Uh, let's go for Paul. Yeah, <laughs> I'll happily take this one. Yeah, the annual allowance, um, it's uh, a total amount that you can actually in theory save to a pension each year. Now this is a change, this is, well, there are some different factors we need to take into account how much earnings there are as well. Um, now, the bit with the annual allowance that does get rather complicated, especially with the NHS pension, it's not about the actual amount that you pay in. So whereas you've got a percentage of your salary that goes into the pension and the employer contribution, because it is a care scheme, almost like a final salary type thing, it's worked on what they call the deemed contribution. So it's, it's very hard for you to go and sort of figure these out. And that was one of the things I saw coming up on the, uh, the sort of the chat that was coming through very very lot about it being complicated it is sadly it really is a complicated thing we will try and simplify and we have tried to go as far as we can however with stuff like that it's very easy for us to, to to work this out for yourself we've got calculators and everything that we can build into it with yourself you get given all of this we'll throw you all the information you get given a lot of information from the NHS as well and like you know you're expected to learn all of this this is where we can hopefully help out with this and it is worth what speaking to a specialist about this but that's yeah that's the annual allowance it's a long answer really to a short question sorry Brilliant. um so AVC so James AVC 20 seconds okay, uh, 20 seconds AVC additional voluntary contributions so on top of your uh, NHS employee employee contributions employer employee you can do ABCs additional voluntary contributions. But again, this is within your annual allowance limit. Brilliant. And scheme pays, Paul? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm not, I'm, I thought I was just saying myself. I mean, yeah, scheme pays, it's an opportunity for you to, uh, with the regards to the annual allowance, uh, for you to actually, not you directly pay it, but have it taken directly from the pension pot as well, which therefore helps out with, if you've not got the money available. However, if you are looking at doing this, it's worth sitting down because it might not be as uh, beneficial as it quite sounds by having the scheme pay for it. Okay, and just staying with you, tapered transition member, what, what does that mean? What's the difference? 
Yeah, I mean, the Taper Transition member, this is to do with the age discrimination that sort of came up to it because there were certain people that were within a certain time uh, scale from retirement. And what they wanted to try and do is lessen the impact to people that were getting that closer to retirement because it would have actually impacted on them. So there were some people that had a kind of a taper inside of it that where they would change over to the 2015 scheme at different stages throughout the uh, the kind of their age group really so it is worth sitting there again with something like that if it was i think when was it it came in for 2015 if you were within 10 years from retirement at that point it would have staggered it beyond there sure brilliant and uh, james finally um one acronym for you so threshold versus adjusted income so threshold income adjusted income <laughs> So again, that does relate to the annual allowance. And because it's more of a taxation, I'm going to throw that one across to Alison. Uh, yeah, the threshold income is basically the taxable income. And that's the amount that you're taxed on and it will be shown in your tax return. The adjusted income is the taxable income plus the amount of pension growth, which you will uh, obtain on your NHS statements. Brilliant, fantastic. Thank you, thank you very much, Alison. Um, so, okay, um, a few fundamental questions, because we've had loads of questions coming in with people asking, how do I know what type of scheme I'm part of? I, I joined on the 95 scheme, I chose not to join in 2008, suddenly I was thrust into the 2015 scheme. Some people who came out of the 2010 scheme uh, went in in 2010, came out in 2011, back in 2016. Um, so how do people know uh, what scheme they joined? Was it when they started NHS service? If they came out, where do they join back in? Yes, yeah, a great question, actually, because um, we have sort of seen and there's a lot of changes with regards to the 95, the 2000 and what the, the 2015 as well. There's all of these different parts. Now, to have changed over the scheme, you'd have had to have kind of to, uh, accept to move across to them so it's worth sort of sitting down and sort of kind of having a look at this so if you've made the request to go across to one of these other schemes alternatively at 2015 everybody got transitioned across apart from those ones which i mentioned before which were 10 years of that um but it'll be quite clear for people to sort of see on these and i saw one of the others was um from about about the how do i get the value of them now, there is the uh, total rewards uh, statement that you can actually get by going on to, there's a web link on there from the NHS, which you should be able to go on there, register and get your valuation of them as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so for those that, that I know there's been a few questions of people struggling to get hold of their uh, pension reward statements and, you know, things not being updated, I think, two or three years prior. And I've been in a similar position and I'm more than willing to answer this question unless Paul's got something further to add. But um, one thing I did um, is because my pension uh, statement wasn't updated for about two or three years. I wrote to them, there was no response. And then eventually I put in a formal complaint. And as soon as I put in a formal complaint within 30 days, everything was sorted. All those months of waiting for someone to respond to me suddenly within 30 days, everything was sorted. Um, so I would encourage you if you are uh, looking at trying to get that updated and you're getting nowhere, you've been trying for months, just put in a complaint and they have to get it done within 30 days. I don't know if Paul or James want to add anything more to that. <laughs> no it's, it's, it's right we've had that a few times actually where the mm -hmm. requests are going through and they get backdated a lot uh, also, they get backlogged a lot with the requests going through um we had a bit of a stage with a lot of our clients where we kind of redone the letters for everybody and got them all to request it at one point uh and that caused a bit of a backlog but like you say if you are getting nowhere you do have the facility to complain to them and it often speeds it all up for you brilliant fantastic and was your the content of your discussion uh, applicable to the NHS England pension scheme or NHS Scotland uh, or both? It is both, but there are some variants in Scotland that we do need to be very mindful of. We've got uh, with the consultants that we've got, we've got very specific uh, people all around the country. So we've got GP uh, specialist financial consultants in Scotland as well, which will be able to talk to them about that. Fantastic. Brilliant. Um, what's the... Um, with regards to sort of the scheme phase, we've, we've had a, a few questions um, about that. Um, and particularly people asking, is it worth paying extra pension tax over the last three years as a lump sum or better to go via scheme pays? And that kind of, I know it's a bit a bit of a specific question, but there've been a lot of questions on that same same theme. And I'm just wondering if I could put that to you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And we get this so many times actually with regards to the scheme pays. Um, 
And a lot of it will be down to, I mean, it is a very personal situation. Uh, the less of an impact as you've got towards uh, retirement. So if it is the last few years, the lesser of an impact it will be because to keep it kind of brief and almost simplified and oversimplified, it's kind of a debt against the pension. So they'll pay it, but it kind of then attracts like an interest rate. So it reduces your pension quite a bit. So the longer that you've got, the bigger the impact, the shorter the period, the less of the impact. So it's absolutely worth sort of sitting down with someone to kind of just have a look at what the impact will be. And it's certainly going to be something when you're looking at the, for those that have happened with this recent judgment, the McLeod side of it, which is what is going to be the right one for me to do? Stay in the 2015 or go to the 95. It will be a personal choice that we have to sit down with you. And we've got, we've got these fantastic things that we should go you right. This will be the impact if you did it this way. And this will be if you did it that way, independent on when you're looking at retiring as well. Brilliant. Okay, fantastic. Um, now, there's one question, and this one really uh, did fascinate me, so I'd love to put this to you. Um, people coming out of the NHS pension scheme and putting things into a private scheme, can they transfer the NHS pension pot into the private scheme? Um, and how does it work in terms of exiting it um, and comparing that to other forms of tax relief, such as SIBs and venture capital trusts and SEISs and, and things like that? <laughs> or alternatively, is it worth temporarily exiting uh, building up a bit of investment elsewhere and then coming back into the NHS pension scheme. Right, I mean, it's we we get this an awful lot with the, the questions where we're looking at with regards to sort of coming in and going out. Now, the NHS pension, I know that there's been a lot of changes in it. I mean, when I joined uh, in well, 16 years ago, uh, it was a brilliantly simplistic kind of pension scheme with very low contributions, retirement ages at 60. Since then, it has got more expensive. The retirement ages have changed. However, it's still a fantastic scheme. And if you're asking for a blanket response, normally the response will be to stay exactly. Sorry, it's gone dark in here. <laughs> uh, the normal... <laughs> light, bulb, light bulb is gone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was trying to manage the lighting because then the bald head it glares off of it. Um, <laughs> but but it's very it's very uh, to see what's going on as a blanket response. The NHS pension is still absolutely fantastic. The value for money is still brilliant. So to when looking at transferring in and transferring out. As a stance, I know for, from my perspective, we wouldn't be looking at going out of uh, the, the NHS pension scheme. And especially if you are looking at saving to your retirement, there are various different things you can be doing. Now, pensions are brilliant. They really are. But I mean, if, if a pension is an option to you, the NHS pension still remains and will remain our first port of call for retirement planning. Once we've got to a fill, uh, sort of pot that's certainly full when you're looking at annual allowance and lifetime, we kind of look at varying different things at that bit. But I, I'd probably be highly reticent to start looking at kind of going out of the NHS pension. And there's, there, we've got a question um, from, from a couple of people about uh, duration of period you can exit the pension scheme. I know that's currently around five years, but if they're extenuating circumstances due to illnesses or bereavements or, or things that have forced people out of the country before they're able to re-enter, mm. are, they, are they still out of the pension scheme or can they, uh, can they do something to get back in? I might call James in with this one because it's, it's a slight... I, I did see that question and it's an interesting mm -hmm. one, actually, because if you've... Uh, left the, the NHS pension like we said there's a varying different things that you can potentially sort of claim on from the pension so if it has been to ill health where you've been unable to work it might be that the pension you can be entitled to a payment from the pension early actually such as the ill health retirement pension however if it's a case of you've been unwell but not able to take that and you've left the scheme about coming back into it the, one of the great things about the new one is it's a bit more flexible with that side of it so you should be able to sort of come back into the scheme uh, so, but it'd be into the 2015, but it was, again, it's certainly something individually we'd need to look at and discuss with that person. The, I think the only thing I would probably add on to that, Paul, is that um, the, when you have left the scheme for longer than 12 months, um, your actual benefits will change. So you will become a deferred member. And the key changes, uh, there are several, but the most uh, uh, ones to be concerned about is the death and service. So when you become a deferred member, you no longer get two times your reckonable pay, death and service. You will then only receive three times your pension accrued as a death and service. In the event of not being able to fulfill your duties due to ill health, to qualify for tier one, you would need to qualify for tier two. 
So becoming a deferred member does have an impact to the individual benefits. But once you go back into the scheme and you are in there again for the full year, those benefits will then come back to you. But what would happen is that you will have a break in service. So as GPs, you wouldn't get any dynamization, any uplift to that pension in that period of time. Okay, so just on that point, um, there are some people that part pay their pension. So they pay for X amount of months per year. So say six months, they're out of the scheme for six months, back in for six months. Um, uh, where would they sit with, with all of these uh, uh, entitlements and benefits? Again, the exact same position. Um, if you are in the pension scheme for at least one month within a rolling 12 months, your benefits will stay in place. Um, as a consultant uh, for Wesleyan, um, it, I do tend to sit on the fence when advising my clients to do this, to go in for three, come out for nine. And because it is actually going to be impacting your end result pension, you're not paying those contributions in, your pension when you go to retire will be less if you had had the full 12 months contributions. The most common thing why uh, consultants and GPs do this, go in and out, is to reduce the tax implications. This is currently the, the tax legislation at the moment. It isn't fair, in my opinion, but hopefully things will change. Okay. Um, and so would the benefit last for the full year if they're in for a month in that financial yes. year? Fine. Okay. Yes. Um, would, there, would there ever be a good time to opt out of, of the scheme? I guess that would depend on individual personal uh, situations and have they reached the saturation point and to sit down with one of you and perhaps go through it that's correct yeah sure okay um what about i'm um, just coming to to locums um so just moving away from the partners and salary side um are locums eligible for ill health retirement pension um uh, are they eligible for the dependents pension benefits and um given that they don't get a death in service pension unless they actually die on the premises, can they, um, what sort of benefits are, are they eligible for? And can they pay part pension from some jobs uh, when, they're, when they're locoming uh, into their NHS pension? Okay, a uh, good, good few uh, couple of questions there. Um, I would probably say from the locum point of view, um, our understanding is that, yes, the death in service doesn't apply. It is a gray area they are hoping to, to look more into. Um, they would still be entitled to ill health retirement. Can a locum pay, can they pick and choose what to put into contributions uh, from, from different locum jobs? From what we believe, it is an all or nothing situation. You've got to make all your contributions uh, to the NHS pension from all your NHS work. Okay, so what about sort of university work with that class as... as as private uh, pension, uh, as a private pension, is, is there an opportunity to defer their university earnings uh, to their NHS pension pot? If the university um, had the facility to contribute towards the NHS pension, then yes, they could pay into it. If the university um, didn't, uh, did, wasn't affiliated with the CARE scheme, which is the 2015 scheme, they may have their own private pension. So they could then choose to pay into the private pension or not. Sure. So supposing that it is affiliated with the NHS pension pot, does that then go into two separate pension pots or is it the, the same pot? It will go all into the one pot. So you, your NHS pension in England uh, will basically be made up of all your employment going into that same pot. And on your total reward statement, it will tell you your practitioner um, employment and any officer work. Your officer work is the work that you are doing outside practitioner. But you can agree uh, with your employment down the university route if they are able to pay down the practitioner route. So, again, that's something on an individual personal basis. Sure. OK. Um, and now just going back to the sort of the dependence benefit again with with a question. Um, do we need to let the NHS pension scheme know about the number of dependents? What if we have no dependents um, or if we have additions to the to the family? No, nope, not at all. Um, upon upon death, of course, the executor of the will will contact the NHS and they will give them all the information uh, that's required. Your personal circumstances can change uh, up until death, so you don't always need to keep them updated with number of dependents, uh, change in spouse. All I would 
suggest and strongly recommend is that everyone has an up-to-date will because the wishes of your will will always dictate where your pension will go to. And, and the pension is calculated as part of the estate? The spouse pension um, is not, but the lump sum that an individual would receive is part of the estate and it, is, it will be assessed for, inher for inheritance tax purposes as well. The NHS pension is one of the very few pensions that do sit inside the estate. So that's a key thing that everyone does need to consider. What is the death and service and how does that actually impact my individual estate? And it's important to ensure that your legacy planning is, is, is taken into consideration. Sure. Okay. Um, now, we've got people who are planning to, to relocate uh, outside of the country and are asking, can they pay into the pension pot from, from abroad, um, into the NHS pension pot? Um, and if not, and if they're new to the pension scheme or new to the NHS, is it worthwhile them putting anything in the NHS pension scheme, given that they're going to be relocating if they can't uh, contribute from abroad? My understanding would be they would need to be employed within the UK to pay into the contributions into the NHS. If they've, they've left the country to work overseas that isn't affiliated with the NHS, they would not be able to pay into the NHS pension. They could look into paying into a private pension. But again, it's down to individual circumstances. Sure. Yeah, it's, what about it's a really good point, James, actually. Sorry to sort of jump in there. It's a really good point. Um, we've had this an awful lot, actually. Um, Certainly, as my my part when I was uh, a consultant myself and dealing with clients, I had a lot of lot of them sort of saying that they they were only going to be here for a, period, a short period of time and then looking at going back, and so therefore didn't join the, the pension scheme. It would still be ours that our sort of stance to these is it's still going to get you more than what you would get if you went out there and kind of um, invested it yourself within any form of other sort of scheme, really. Unless you took some really high risk kind of parts to it. So it's, the NHS pension is still a fantastic. Uh, parts of sort of join into the bit with it being a short period of time absolutely understand it and it would be something that we'd sit down with uh, but my experience has been when people have done that they've actually been here longer than what they anticipated at which point then they've just deferred the decision and to sort of go back and try and catch up which is not possible really sure and um, are you able to make a, a little bit of a, a, a sort of a summary of what happens for people retiring early uh, so people, for example, wanting to, to, to retire by the age of, of 50. Um, the, that was a really good question I saw, actually, which was um, somebody sort of pointed out that they sort of said about wanting to go at 50. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing with uh, pension benefits and certainly with uh, the changes in legislation that's happened recently is um, it's been for the last few years. There is an early limit that you can actually an early stage at which you can take your pension, which is increasing. Um, and at the moment, the earliest you can take your uh, any pension benefits is the age of 55. So if you're looking to retire before that, obviously, there's no stopping you uh, retiring whenever you want, because retirement is just a case of, and I think the Americans have got a fantastic acronym, which is what they call FIRE, which is Financial Independence Retire Early. And it's just giving you that financial independence to say that I don't no longer have to work anymore and therefore can live off of my means. Uh, the idea that we have uh, here is very much the pension is, is the part that provides you with necessary income. Now, it's a brilliant thing to be looking at because it is potential to retire early if your pension pot is there. If you want to go before 55, um, then it might just be that we need to build up pots to kind of cover you, your income between that until your pension kicks in whenever it does. And that can be because uh, if you do take the pension early, there are reductions to it. There's what they call these actuarial reductions which will be a small amount or kind of it gets larger the earlier that you look at retiring, depending on when it is and how much you've got in there. It can be of a benefit, though, if you do then have lifetime allowances by taking it a bit early to reduce some of those as well. So it's certainly worth sitting down with someone. If that is your plan to kind of we, we're looking at these things where we can go, right, well, how much income do you need? Where can we get these from? And look at all the different sources that we can support with that. Brilliant, fantastic. Um, and, um, well, sorry, I was going to say one thing I'd also add on, yeah. um, add on to that as well, Paul, is the, currently your retirement age is 55, that you can draw any pension scheme. But when planning your retirement, things we've got to take into account as pension changes that we know now. And Paul did mention that the pension age will be changing. So in 2028, the minimum pension age will be 57. So it's taking that into consideration when you're planning your retirement that yes you can take your pension earlier and you're happy to you're happy for the actuarial reduction that penalty 
But again, the minimum age will be 57 at that point. Fantastic. Brilliant. OK. Um, so we've got a question here, which is a little bit um, at, at, at a slight tangent. No one's even asked this question about pension sex discrimination. Um, so for women who reduced work for a set period of time to look after dependents, the 1995 uh, pension scheme didn't really discriminate in this way as it was based more on the final salary pension. Um, is that correct? And where do people sit now um, with this new pension scheme with uh, sex discrimination against women who, who perhaps have reduced sessions to, to look after dependents. You know that that you know that's absolutely a fantastic question. Uh, it's a question that I've never come across before, and I'd be more than happy to take that away and do a bit of research and come back to you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and uh, I would actually ju just uh, request the person who, who wrote that question, perhaps maybe um, if you go onto the link, the wesleyan.co.uk forward slash RCGP webinar, um, and I'm sure we've got a slide somewhere that we can put up shortly, uh, just to remind everyone of that link. Um, I'd encourage you to go uh, reach out to a Wesleyan uh, financial consultant and, and sit down and speak to them about the implications of that. Um, we've got a question about uh, CARE, um, which I presume is an acronym uh, for younger uh, members of the pension scheme currently working, for example, seven sessions. If they drop down to five sessions um, at the age of 55, um, can they, do you have a rough calculation as to the impact that would have and does CARE look at the entire service or is it weighted towards later career? So the CARE is, the, again, is the 2015 section uh, or currently until the next pension reform. So CARE being career average revalued earnings. So this is based on the 54th scheme. So it, it, it's a great question and it's a great way for you to plan your future uh, career path. At the end of the financial year, you will have your pensionable earnings and the CARE scheme will take your pensionable earnings, divide that by 54, and that amount of uh, money is then put into a, a small little pension pot. That pension pot is what you've accrued based on those earnings. And every single year, that little pension pot will increase by inflation and 1.5%. And that will happen continuously every single year till you draw it. This will allow you to increase or reduce your earnings throughout your whole career. So when you're, when you're approaching retirement, 55, 60, 65, you will be able to reduce the sessions, reduce your earnings, and it won't actually impact your pension the way the 95 scheme would at a final salary, because it's not your final salary. Your pension is based on an average throughout your whole career. So this allows you to work more sessions at any age you wish. I hope that helped. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you. No, I'm just cognizant that actually I haven't asked uh, Alison a question. Um, and we've got loads of questions that I think um, Alison would be able to, to help out with. So Alison, if I come across to you. So we've got a few people asking about uh, locum work and working through a limited company uh, and contributions to the pension scheme. So if we, if we start with that. Um, so locums looking to contribute towards a pension scheme, uh, those that are self-employed versus uh, a limited company. Yeah, I mean, lo lo locums um, should fill in uh, A and B forms and then they send them to PCSE for English people and then they're processed in the same way as um, GPs um, pay their deductions via the PMS and GMS statements. But uh, locums don't have to uh, pension their earnings. They've got 10 weeks from the end of the period that they've earned them to submit the A and B forms to PCSA. Sure. So um, what about our colleagues across in Scotland? Um, what would they do? I'm not, I'm not quite sure about Scotland. I'd, I'd have to um, research, research that because we don't tend to de deal with very many Scottish clients. No, absolutely, absolutely, completely understandable. Um, now, from the point of view of uh, locum uh, income, can you choose what you uh, put towards a pension scheme and what you do not? Yeah, it's, it's just a question of sending in forms A and B um, and getting them completed by the practice that you're working for and then, and then submitting them to PCSE. So you can decide whether to um, submit for one month and then not the next or submit for some practices and not the next. Brilliant, fantastic. All right, okay. Um, so coming back to, to, to 
Paul um, and James, uh, just a, another couple of quick questions that, that we've had in. Um, benefits um, or perhaps hazards of applying for IP 2016 if the April 2016 valuation amounts to 1 million and 73,000 or 55,000 or however much it was. And uh, once claimed, does the monthly pension increase with inflation? Oh, God. Well, there, with regards to applying for it, there's no harm in applying for it. It won't affect anything by you actually applying and having it in place. In, in theory, if it's about what your value, what your value evaluation of your pension was at that point in time. So, I mean, it's worth actually if, if sitting down with someone and if it is above it, then we can apply for the pe uh, protection to it because it will protect it, the actual lifetime allowance at a higher amount than what it will just, because if you don't, it just reverts back to what the lifetime allowance is for the current year. So by applying for it, gives you that security. By not, it could affect then additional taxation down the line. But like I say, it's just worth sitting down with someone to just make sure. Absolutely. Um, so we've got, we've got someone that's asked an interesting question, actually, um, as a sort of a bit of an adjunct to the previous question that we asked. So can you claim for a pension in two different countries at the same time? But yeah, I mean, at the end, of the, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, actually, because the NHS pension uh, with regards to um, what when you can claim it is literally, it, it doesn't matter in theory where in the world that you are. So you can claim on that pension uh, wherever you are, wherever you decide to retire it can then be paid. I mean, as far as if you've then left with, say, 10, 15 years service within the NHS here, and then the light goes again. Um, mm -hmm. and, and Have you not paid your bills? It's, do you know what? I've, I've had to sit in a dark room so the light's coming off the computer because, like I said, <laughs> otherwise it does glare. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you've then got a pension elsewhere uh, within, say, 15 years here, then 15 years in Canada or America or anything, it's, it's irrelevant of where you can claim. You can just have as many as you like, really. Brilliant, fantastic. Um, Alison, um, with regards to submitting pension statements and pension documents, um, if the practice already has an account, and I presume they would do that on behalf of, of the GPs there, is that correct? Sorry, I beg your pardon, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, so um, with regards to pension certificates and, and documents, I believe the accountants would do that on behalf of the GPs in the practice, is that correct? Yes, well, well, we, we prepare the uh, certificates for our clients, for the GP principals, and we also prepare type twos for GP um, locums and so, also, uh, sorry, GP salaried. Okay, um, and uh, we've had quite a few questions on a similar theme. So um, a, a very basic question, but where does one find their total reward statement? Sorry, when does one? Uh, where does one find their total reward statement from? Um, you you um, lo log on to PCSA and you should get it from there. But what we've been finding that many of our clients, the, um, they have all the certificates haven't been processed by PCSA going back to 2014-15. But what we've been finding, if we ask our clients to upload them electronically, all the missing certificates, then all the records magically seem to be there. So it seems <laughs> that PCSA haven't been processing paper certificates. Absolutely, okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, I think that they're running at a two, three year deficit really, aren't they at the moment, or two, three years uh, um, behind. Um, so we've got um, another few questions that people have asked us before uh, this session. I know that I haven't really covered those. So uh, just uh, picking some out. Um, how can I make sure all my pension contributions from my three NHS jobs all go into, into one pension pot? I think we've, we've already answered that, actually. Um, we've talked about living abroad. Um, how can one find out how close they are to the lifetime allowance? I guess this is where your services would, would come in. Is that right, Paul and James? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a real uh, touch, uh, touch point where what we can do is sit down, have a look at the, the NHS pension from the tech rewards to have a look at what that's accumulated to. We've got a fantastic report that will show you uh, where you are currently, where you're likely to be as well coming to retirement. So we can actually manage the, uh, the part with the lifetime allowance, annual allowance can be built, built into it as well to see where we are with those. And it'll help actually kind of for you to plan towards when it is that you're looking to retire and the effects of possibly taking it early. Because one of the bits that's really quite interesting that we've, uh, I've seen that there's been a few comments about the uh, total uh, lump sum that can be taken from the pension, that can actually help with it as well. So what we can then do is sort of saying, well, well, actually taking the lump, a higher lump sum could potentially reduce 
the lifetime allowance as well. So there's a lot of options that when you do get to retirement as well, it's not just a case of this is what my pension is going to be. This is what my lump sum is going to be. It is a case of sitting down and kind of working out what's the best way for you to take uh, the pension at that point as well. Okay. Uh, what about um, people, can, can people retire twice? So can they retire from the 95 scheme at the age of 60 and then from the 2015 scheme at 65, 67, whatever it's going to be? Go on, James, I'll let you answer that one. I said you'd say that. Okay, yep, yeah, uh, of course they can, definitely. So, uh, for example, if you're in the 95 scheme, the scheme retirement age is 60. So you can take your pensions for that scheme at 60. What will then happen is you will, uh, in the eyes of the NHS, you would have retired. You'll no longer be paying contributions into your other schemes, it being the 2008 or the 2015. And you could then call upon those pensions at a later age. You could call upon them anytime between 60, 65 or your state retirement age, or you can wait till the end. What will happen with the pensions that you're not contributing to or haven't touched, they will stay preserved and will increase in line with inflation. I'm just going to briefly touch on um, what Paul mentioned before and also Alison about the total reward statement. One thing that we do encourage all our clients to do is to go onto the total reward website and download your statement. Now, when you do log on, if your statement isn't there, you, are, you then have the right to contact NHS Pension Services Direct and request a pension uh, statement, a total reward statement. They have a duty to give you a pension statement once a year. And if it's not online, they have to manually put one together for you. This can then be sent to you through the post. And what you're able to do is sit down with your consultant, um, your financial consultant at Wesleyan, can be a pension person and we can help you walk through your total reward statements and if there are missing years of employment we can then fill those gaps by looking at your existing accounts your existing wage slips we can fill those gaps to actually calculate what your pension would be now if there are missing years sure so what about people who've, who've lost their forms for example or, or um, they can't find any of the forms that were submitted, how do they make sure that their pension contributions aren't lost? What you're able to do um, from doing the research on your total reward statement, something that Alison mentioned uh, previously, you can contact NHS pensions and ask for a, um, an employment history of your time in the NHS. Uh, it's a bit like your own CV and it will show you all your employments that you've had in the NHS and it will also show you your contributions. We can then look at that with your total reward statement and kind of fill in the gaps and then work with you to get the missing years put back on. Something like this doesn't always happen straight away. It can take several months for something like this to happen. Fantastic. And um, what about maternity leave so, or, or parental leave? You know, if someone's taking parental leave, will that affect their um, continuity of their service? Um, does having a break, a uh, full parental leave, affect their pension? It's a good question, Paul. Uh, well, much the same as what you go back to with before. I mean, because when you're in the maternity side of it, um, uh, you just kind of leave it, but there's no contributions going into the actual scheme whilst you're actually on that time. So, I mean, it's, it, again, it depends on how long you take as well, certainly within the GPs, because it's going to be something which is whether you're a salaried or whether you're a partner, what the actual uh, contract will state as well, where you are in these bits. So it's with GP partners, it gets a bit more complicated because if they're applying and, applying and locum to actually kind of cover themselves, in theory, they've still got drawings and such to sort of be considering. So it's what's being paid into the pension will be affecting it. Brilliant. Okay. Um, with the recent challenge in consultation on moving from the 2015 pension back to the 1995 uh, section, where does this leave ERRBO contributions that people may have made over the last six plus years? And if you, for those of us that don't understand what ERRBO means, if you could please also explain that as well. <laughs> That's the I, early retirement buyout option. Correct me if I'm wrong with that, James. That's right. Yeah. So I'll let you answer the rest of it. I've done that a bit. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I did see this, and uh, again, very good question. Um, because this is only a proposal, 
um, that's been given. Um, it's the question that we've actually raised ourselves for clients who have been who have paid into the the Erbo um, or, or are doing the additional pension payments to have an additional pension when they retire. What happens to this? We're still waiting for the answer. So again, we still have until 2022 to finalize all the final details. So it is a case of watch this space. Brilliant, fantastic. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very aware of the time and I know we should probably be wrapping up over the next three or four minutes and I've probably got more questions than I can ask over the next next three hours or, or so. Um, so I think probably what might be worthwhile doing is just maybe um, handing over to, to, to Paul, James and Alison to perhaps say, a couple of minutes just to just to uh, have a, a conclusive uh, or concluding statement from from each of you uh, about the pension uh, scheme. If there's anything that perhaps wasn't covered that you'd like a, like to cover, um, and then we'll we'll end with that. Um, so, Paul, if we begin with you. Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, I, I did see. I mean, the problem with the the pension side of it, it is incredibly complex. We tried to kind of go through the key facts, and to to oversimplify it would be doing it a bit of disservice. Now, there are a lot of factors with the NHS pension that we have to take into account. And it's not a case of one size fits all with this. It is certainly something when we're looking to, if you're making any kind of thoughts, any kind of uh, considerations with regards to the NHS pension, it's worth sitting down with someone so we can explain just exactly what it means specifically to you. And in clear language, one of the things that what we try to do is on a presentation is make it as clear as possible. But what we will do when we're on a one to one, we can link it back personally to what it is for yourself. There are the, the NHS pension does remain a fantastic scheme. So, James, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that. No, nothing at all. Um, other than thank you for uh, for listening to me. Again, it is a complex subject. Um, it is an, an exciting thing to present. We do try and make it as, as simple, as clear as possible. Uh, really appreciate the amount of questions that we've had uh, this evening. Um, I wish you could stay in and answer more. And I will, will try and answer as many as we can uh, after the meeting. But thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. And, and Alison, and any concluding statements? Yeah, well, I, I would just recommend that everybody make sure that their pension records are up to date. Um, get a total reward statement um, if you can. Other than that, write to NHS pensions and ask for your employment history or write to HMRC and ask them for your employment history because um, the NI office will have details of all your earnings from day one. Um, finally, I would say that if anybody's got any problems, if they want to give me a call at Yorkshire Medical Accountants, they're very free to. Thank you for your time. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's bringing us very close to, to the end of our time, unfortunately. So thank you very, very much uh, to Paul Forder, James Gunnery, Alison Fox, um, and to everyone that's, uh, that's joined us uh, and given up your evening to learn more about the NHS pension scheme. So we hope you've found this event helpful. I know there's been lots and lots of terminology, lots and lots of complex statements, but we've tried to break this down to make it a little bit more understandable. But clearly, um, this is probably just the starting point for you to go on and have those journeys and exploration further into your NHS pension scheme. And if you still have questions um, and you'd like to discuss your personal situations with one of, the, with one of Wesleyan's financial consultants, um, the contact details um, are or will be on the screen uh, shortly. Uh, we'll make them uh, available to you at the end of this event. It's been pasted on the chat function on a number of occasions. Um, and that uh, link is oh, it's right in front of you, wesleyan.co.uk forward slash RCGP webinar. Can't get easier than that. Um, and if you're happy to be contacted by Wesleyan about any related topics, please make sure to complete the follow-up feedback, uh, which will be emailed across to you. And let us know your thoughts about this webinar, what worked well for you, what didn't work uh, so well for you. We've really enjoyed bringing it to you, but we're always keen to know how we can improve. And finally, if you're watching this on demand uh, on YouTube, uh, please see the description box below for details on how you can contact Wesleyan for a one-to-one -one discussion too. Thanks for joining everyone, and I hope to see you again at future RCGP events. Do keep a lookout on rcgp.org.uk to see what else is coming up soon. And with that, I wish you all a good night. <laughs>